Good morning and thank you for joining us. I'd like to extend greetings to all of you, whether you are joining from our local area in Arizona or whether you are uh, among those viewing this message at a later time from such places as Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, and perhaps other areas. I just want you to know that I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be able to share God's word with you. Uh, whether you live nearby or far away, it is a blessing to come to you today and to share a word from the Lord from scripture. You know, a common question that is posed in gospel tracts and literature and evangelism efforts in mainline churches mostly, is that if you were to die tonight, do you know if you would go to heaven? Well, the question uh, no doubt is well-intentioned, but there is a statement made by Jesus that is a rather shocking answer to many concerning that question. It's found in John chapter 3, verse 13. I want you to note carefully what he says, in that he says, no one has ascended into heaven. Now, that's a radically different statement from the popular belief, high in the sky when you, uh, when you die, which many, maybe most people hold to. But I think it's important that we take a closer look at this statement by Jesus in John 3, 13 and the surrounding verses in John 3. It's a very important chapter. So let's begin with the first two verses in John 3, where it says that now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Nicodemus was an influential man in Israel at that time. He had some rather impressive religious credentials. We are told that he was a Pharisee, and that's significant, a ruler of the Jews. And he had obviously heard much about Jesus and apparently was trying to better understand him and what he was about. And so he chose to have, as we read here, a nighttime conference and conversation with Jesus. Now, that does not necessarily mean that he was embarrassed or ashamed to be around Jesus, but likely it would seem, and we're only speculating, but likely he wanted to have an uninterrupted conversation and with Jesus, that was a rather difficult thing, so this was the best way to do it. So as we read here, we note that Nicodemus had concluded that Jesus must certainly be one who has been sent from God because the miraculous, uh, the miracles and the signs that were done by and through him were beyond human capability. So he recognizes the mark of God upon Jesus. John 3, verse 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, whatever it was that Nicodemus may have had in mind to discuss with Jesus, we would guess that this likely was not the direction that he expected the conversation to turn to. Jesus' statement is dramatic and we might say also confrontational in that he states an absolute prerequisite for entrance into the coming kingdom of God is rebirth, a phrase and a concept that we will see that Nicodemus, as we read on, is completely unfamiliar with. Verse 4, John 3. <clears throat> Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? An interesting question. At physical birth, a child potentially has all that is needed for life in the physical, material world. We are born, shall we say, equipped for this life. To be born again means that we must be equipped with all that is needed for life in another realm, namely the spiritual unseen realm of the kingdom. Now, Nicodemus, uh, as we read on here, is deeply perplexed, trying to reason how it is possible for this to be so, to be born again. 
Jesus answers in John 3, verse 5. It says, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, again, this is emphatic, he says he cannot enter <clears throat> into the kingdom of God. So while verse 3 and verse 5 are emphatic, Jesus gives some further details as to what this born again thing is really all about, what it means. And as he says in verse 5, it has something to do with water and the Spirit. Now, if Nicodemus knew anything at all about Jesus' baptism, if he was familiar with that, he might have better understood what it was that Jesus was saying here. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, detail Jesus' baptism, and it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth into Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening, and the spirit like a dove descending upon him and a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son in you. I am well pleased. In the book of Acts, we see something very similar with those who had responded to the gospel message that day. Acts 2 verse 38, I point out a very important verse. We refer to it often. Peter said to them, those who were cut to the heart, he said, repent and each of you be baptized, that refers to water, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit born of water and the Spirit. Jesus had stated in John 3, 5, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Very interesting statement because Jesus is pointing out that there are two distinct and very different realms. There is the physical, fleshly realm that is clearly evident, that which we see around us that we live in. There is also the invisible but equally real spirit realm. And so we might say that there are two parallel universes, the material and the spiritual. And it's a bit similar to the two different realms that air-breathing mammals live in and the realm of fish living in water. <clears throat> and we know that they're very different. Humans will drown if they are submerged in, the, in water and fish will certainly die trying to breathe on land. They neither are fit for the other's realm. So physical beings must be radically transformed and equipped for life in the spirit realm. And this is very well described for us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, where it says there, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, the perishable inherit <coughs> the imperishable. Again, a very emphatic statement very similar to what Jesus says in John 3, verses 3 and 5. So Jesus continues here, verses 7 and 8. He says to Nicodemus, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So to uh, help Nicodemus better understand this concept of spirit, Jesus refers to natural spirit, pneuma, or wind. And there is no question that wind is real because we see and we hear its effects. The sounds of blowing, in some cases dramatically with tornadoes. But we also see the movement of trees and leaves and so we know that the wind is real. But the fact is, we don't know, as Jesus points out, we don't know where the wind came from. We don't know its destination. And he says, so it is. It is similar to those who are born by Holy Spirit, born again by Holy Spirit. At this point in the narrative here, Nicodemus pleads for some clarity. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? As if to say, Jesus, tell me more, explain more. 
And you know, perhaps, and this might be speculating a bit, but Jesus' patience may have worn a bit thin with this man because we notice his reply, verses 10 to 12 here in John 3, it says, Jesus answered, Jesus answered, excuse me, and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, he says, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So we get the idea Nicodemus is not understanding at all. So as Jesus spoke of spirit, and as he spoke about new birth, he was not speaking of something that was new and unknown as he berates Nicodemus. Nicodemus should have been familiar at least with the concept uh, from passages such as Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 28, a passage should have been very familiar to him that says, uh, Ezekiel speaking uh, under inspiration, then I will sprinkle, and this is really the word of God through Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, notice, and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. And so within that prophecy, uh, those words from literally from God himself is the concept of being born again. So Jesus here in John three was clarifying that which had been prophesied by Ezekiel the prophet many years in advance. But from what we see of Nicodemus, he is not understanding of any of these things. So continuing on, John 3, verses 13 down to verse 18, Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The heavenly realm is the realm, <clears throat> excuse me, is the realm of the Spirit. And Jesus is absolutely clear in stating that no one has ascended into that realm. The Apostle Peter would declare in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost that David did not ascend to heaven, according to verse 34 in Acts 2. So this man after God's own heart, as David is called, as we are told here, did not ascend to heaven at death. And then Jesus made the blanket declaration, as we've been reading here in John 3, that no man has ascended there. And he stated that his origins uniquely were from heaven, referring literally to his father who resides in the heavenly realm. And Jesus then gives an example that would have been very familiar to Nicodemus and to, to all Jewish people, that being Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And the account of that is found in Numbers chapter 21. We really don't have time in our study today to get into that, but I would suggest that would be a very important passage for you to study on your own to gain some further understanding. But the point Jesus makes is that he would be lifted up on a cross similar to the way in which Moses lifted up a serpent on a pole during a plague of death of serpents so that those who would look at that serpent on the pole might 
look in faith and live, a, a similar parallel, looking to Jesus in faith through his sacrifice. Now, no verse is more familiar to more people than John 3, 16 that we looked at. Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, or really literally the life of the age to come. And this is the essence of what Jesus is teaching here about being born again, that it is based on faith and nothing else. It is about accepting something, not doing something. It is faith and it is belief specifically in his only begotten son. You know, someone has said fathers beget and mothers conceive. And the point being here that Jesus came into the human realm as any child does, begat by a father and conceived by a mother. Now, of course, the key difference here is that the self-existing creator was the one who begat him miraculously through spirit and through a human woman, his mother. Now, God's gracious plan is to rescue all who would come in faith and be born again through water and spirit. To believe and to be born again is to enter into the spirit realm. But as he says here, unbelief is, is something perilous because it is refusal to accept, again, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And so this second birth here that Jesus speaks about is not something that is optional. It is an imperative. And as someone has said, do not substitute anything for the new birth. You may be a member of a church, but church membership is not a new birth. So it is said that every person faces two options. First of all, born once, die twice. Second option, born twice and die once. All who are born naturally will eventually die. And if we are not born again through water and spirit, as Jesus speaks about it here, we are destined for a second death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. But to be born again, to be born twice, we only face the prospect of natural death once. So instead of death in judgment fire, we face the very bright prospect of eternal life, immortality, life in the coming new age on earth at the return of Jesus. So regardless of religion or church affiliation, unless one is born again that Jesus mentions here in John 3, his or her religion or church affiliation or any of these works we might do will not get us into the kingdom of God. And that is a vitally important point to make. And so the all important question before each one of us, each of us must deal with this question. And that is, have you been born again? As Jesus speaks about it here. So have you taken the step of water baptism to signify that decision of faith and to prepare you then to receive Holy Spirit into your life. And, and really, honestly, this question, have you been born again? It is a question that can only be answered in one of two ways. It is either yes or it is no. There is no in between. There is no maybe to that question. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away and behold, new things have come. That is the reality for those who are born again of water in the spirit. So these things said, I pray that you would seriously consider Jesus imperative statement in John 3, 5 again. Truly, truly, he says, I say to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice again, it is an absolute prerequisite. So may we each one humbly, prayerfully, thoughtfully consider this eternally important statement from Jesus because our lives and our destiny literally depend upon it. Let's close out our time today in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your inspired word. And Lord Jesus, we especially are thankful to you 
for this account of your conversation with Nicodemus. We are thankful for what you have set forth in terms of being born again, of born of water and the Spirit as an absolute essential to entering into the life of the kingdom age. And so we see with great clarity the importance of your statement. And so many would ask, do I have to be baptized in order to enter the kingdom of God? And, and your answer stands clear for all who would consider that. It is not our requirement, it is yours. And so water baptism, we understand, is, is merely a declaration of the faith that we have in our hearts, but is also closely tied, we think of Acts 2.38, is closely tied to receiving the gift of Holy Spirit as we repent, as we believe in Jesus in faith. So we see this laid out for us. And so, again, it is not what we do. So many are focused upon things I can do to, to enter into the kingdom of God. And we know there's nothing we can do. We must simply receive. And we're thankful it's made simple and clear to us. But it is certainly an imperative. Father, my prayer is for each one watching and listening today that, that each would very carefully consider what you have said about this need to be born again. And may we declare that with others in our conversations and our sharing that others too might be challenged, confronted, and uh, realize the opportunity to be had in being born again, becoming new creatures in order to enter into the realm of the kingdom of God. We look forward to the day when our faith will be sight. We look forward to the day when that kingdom, that invisible spirit realm become truly visible to us as we become uh, fully spiritual in every sense of the word. We long for that time and we know that day will come. Jesus, you've promised that you will come again. An angel declared to the disciples that as you've seen him go, he will come in the same way. We know that. We believe in that. And that is our resolute faith. And so may we persevere. May we live wisely. May we make the decisions we need to make as we await that time. But find us faithful. Find us faithful witnesses, light in a dark world. Direct and guide us, each one, and help us to guide others. And we just, again, are thankful for this great, important message we see here in John 3. And uh, again, may you direct us, sharing it and having wisdom concerning it. Thank you for this time. Uh, Father, we thank you for, again for your abundant provision all through your son, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Even so come, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thank you for sharing uh, and allowing me to share with you today. It's been a blessing. This passage in particular is so very, very important. And I trust that the message of it penetrates deeply into your life and uh, that you very carefully uh, consider the implications and meaning of it for you. Again, thank you for sharing this time. I look forward to sharing again in the near future. Until such time, may God watch over and guide. Until next time, so long and God bless. Mm -hmm.